Welcome to the Seattle Investors Club podcast with Julie Clark and Joe Bauer, where we share the nuts and bolts of real estate investing from our 20 plus years in the industry. Sit back, relax, listen, and immediately take action. Are you ready? Here we go. Welcome to the Nuts and Bolts of Real Estate Investing Podcast. My name is Joe Bauer and I'm here with my co-host, Julie Clark. Julie, how are you doing today? I'm all good, Joe. Sitting here doing a little homeschool math quiz with the girls. Um, uh, you know, super excited to talk to our guest, Matthew Gardner, today, which I've been bragging about the last few days, him coming on the show. So um, what are you up to? Where are you at these days? I'm actually over in San Diego, which we jammed over here to hopefully get some sun, but it is not sunny. It's rainy. Well, I don't know. It's a pretty calm day here. I can always tell because I park my car outside and I can tell by how frosted my windows are or not, what kind of day it's going to be as far as the weather goes, because my garage is so jam packed full of people's crap from their houses I've had to move out or all the kids stuff that... um. I've actually got Katie uh, Katie on the ticket today for 20 bucks to clean out the garage so I can start parking the car in the garage for the winter. So that's that's <laughs> what we got going on here. Um, but what we all have going on, I'm going to transition here because we have a very important guest today and we want to jump right to it. As I said today, guys, I am so excited. Today we have Matthew Gardner with us on the show, who is the chief economist for Windermere Real Estate. He analyzes and interprets economic data and its impacts on the housing market, both on a local and national level. And the the interesting thing about this is somehow Matthew, over all these years, has succeeded um, in making economics actually interesting for the average person, including myself. He is the go-to guy for presentations for economic and market analysis. Um, He offers an independent perspective that is well respected and that is why we are so honored to have him on the show today so matthew thank you so much for your time and welcome to the nuts and bolts of real estate investing podcast great uh, well thank you guys I'm happy to be here <laughs> well joe let's get right to it because i know his time is so valuable and i have so much to talk to him about today yeah, absolutely. So Matthew, our first question is always to jump back in the real estate time machine. And we'd love to know where you grew up, how you grew up, and how that led you to where you are today. Oh, wow. Um, how long have you got? <laughs> uh, so uh, born, born and raised in London, um, many, many, many moons ago. Uh, born in West London, uh, packed off to boarding school as was the, the thing to do back then when I was very young. Never actually came, went home after that. So uh, stayed in, in London, then the home counties. Then I went up to Oxford for my undergrad. And uh, I'll never forget my mother uh, saying to me, like, what the hell are you going to do with an economics degree? I'm like, well, mum, yeah, every decision you make, I can find an economic principle behind it. I should always have a job. At which point <laughs> I got her blessing. But what she didn't quite uh, understand at the time was that I was going to stay in school far, far longer than she had an- anticipated. So I got my undergrad at Oxford, then I went to the London School of Economics, I mastered my doctorate. So uh, that then brought me into getting a real job. And my first job back in the UK was for a, a land, what's called a land agency. And these are companies that manage estates uh, for, for wealthy people. And the company I work for, Cluttons, they manage the portfolios for the Crown and the Church of England. Wow. And so, uh, again, long story short, I first came to the States because you guys didn't get it all back in 1776. Uh, the crown kept rather large bits. And so it was my responsibility for analyzing that portfolio, which is obviously mainly uh, in and around Boston and, and New York. It's one of my only lifelong NDAs. I can't tell you exactly where it is. <laughs> so I came across to Seattle to visit my sister. She was working for Microsoft. And I looked around and said, well, who analyzes real estate here? And this is back in the early 1990s. Uh, no one did. And pretty much most developers kind of licked their thumbs, stuck it in the air and said, we'll build that, which is why, by the way, the Columbia Center got built. Anyway, wow. uh, so uh, again, I then thought, OK, it's, uh, this is where I'm going to go. Um, hung my shingle out. I had my own consulting practice for well, 14 years, but a very long term client of mine was Windermere. And about five years ago, uh, they eventually talked me into coming in house with them. And uh, that's where I am now. And my goal is to basically educate not just brokers, but the general public into really what's going on in terms of housing and the economy. I think it's remarkably important for everyone, especially now, 
to have a complete grasp of, uh, of really kind of what's what's going on and what does it mean. So that's what I do. I spend all my life doing it. I've been analyzing housing now for almost 30 years. So it's been a long time. Wow. Great, great backstory. I've been, like I said, a major fan of yours uh, for, I don't know, 20 years, like I said. We talked, we talked about some of our our common friends that we know in commercial real estate in the in the in that bigger pond. And man, yeah, I feel like this is like a full circle moment for me today um, to have you on the show. So I appreciate it. You know, I don't even have this question on my list for you, but it, it makes me just listening to you want to ask, you know, have you, how do you feel things have changed in how um, the internet, I, it sounds like I'm dumb saying this, but how the internet and the quick immediate dissemination of information, I just feel like things can happen on a dime these days, which makes your job harder. Um, how do you feel that 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 the the revolution in the technology of the world and the internet has changed your job? Oh, massively. I mean, uh, if you've been around real estate long enough, I mean, I clearly remember the days of always having a, a Thomas guy or Thompson guy in the back of my car, which is all we had to get directions to go and find new plats. Right. Uh, that and uh, the Iris system, and, and um, which is kind of the old days of very early internet, uh, which is how we basically, I could download every single listing in the, the multiple. But the bottom line is that technology uh, and technological evolutions become exponential. And that c- it has been an amazing thing in certain respects. And uh, I think personally, a very negative thing in others. And um, when I say negative, what do I mean by that? But I think we've gone from a knowledge-based society to an information-based society. Uh, what that means is we used to have a very deep knowledge of certain things. Well, now we know a whole ton, uh, a, a lot of stuff, but our knowledge is actually kind of about an inch deep and a mile wide. Right. So Google's been allowed us to become experts on everything. Uh, but I mean, I think technology in terms of real estate, I think it has overall been been a, been a positive without a doubt. I mean, we're finding now people buying homes sight unseen just because you can take a, a virtual walkthrough. And so I think there are positives about it. Uh, however, I'm a, a big fan of, of deeper knowledge and a deeper understanding, and especially when it comes to housing, given the fact that for roughly 97% of us, it's the most expensive thing we'll ever buy in our lives. Right. So having that, that deep knowledge, that deep understanding, I think is remarkably important. So I think the positives do outweigh the negatives. But uh, I think there's a lot of things that people think they understand, whether it be about mortgage rates or various other things, that they, they really don't. And so I, what I love to do uh, is to talk to them about that and, and really help them understand what it really means. And what you just hit on the head on that is what actually real estate agents and investors who meet with sellers, who's part of our audience, mortgage brokers, everybody should be, their message should be about that, like explaining the deeper details because everybody's so surface level today. And, and what I find interesting, which is a huge impact, probably I would assume also in your business, is behavioral behavioral reactions to surface level information. So people yeah. don't go deep, but they make huge decisions based on behaviors. So there's this entire industry of studying behaviors and all the modern brokerage firms are plugging in behavioral study into their lead generation. Um, we, today I'm at eXp Realty and it's our big annual conference week. And we just had a presentation this morning by the Center for Generational Kinetics. Do you know about these guys? I'm afraid it I don't. Absolutely. I, I think you should check it out. It was absolutely fascinating. It was a, a study of generational behaviors. Hmm which I think sort of is all kind of, it impacts reactions, which impacts forecasting. I don't know. I'm just- this Yeah, is I mean, it, so there, there's a whole group out there who, who analyze what's, what's called psychographics. And what that psychographics is, is it basically distills the entire population of America I- into certain buckets. Now, uh, I, they have some great names. I mean, kids and cul-de-sacs is a, is a group of people. <laughs> uh, Blue Blood Estates is another one. Where, where they get, but I think my issue with that is that you're taking over 300 million people and trying to distill them down into a very finite uh, uh, 
the number of buckets. And I don't think we can really work that way. Right. But I mean, certainly in terms of people's understanding, it's all ri- originally actually came from the advertising industry, predominantly the car industry. Uh, and the car industry is has always been so far ahead of the curve when it comes to advertising and marketing. Uh, that, I mean, they spend just hundreds of millions of dollars on it uh, and really trying to figure out who we are in order to that for them to sell their product to us. So, yeah, but it is a, absolutely a fascinating thing uh, to look at. Absolutely. So let's dial it back into the economics and the housing, guys. So um, just to confirm, the markets that you're currently providing economic and market analysis on, I know we're here in the Pacific Northwest in the Seattle area and that you are a Windermere's economist, mm-hmm. but um, just for everybody that's listening, because we do actually have listeners across the majority of the U.S., and we have a lot of local people that invest outside um, the Seattle area in other markets. So are you, you know, people are going to want to follow you if they, if you know, you kind of had your head in the sand, guys, actually, if you don't know who Matthew Gardner is, honestly. But just in case, what markets can they find that you provide information on? Is it right now? Uh, it, the ten, essentially, the 10 Western states. So okay. uh, Oregon, Washington, California, Idaho, Nevada, Montana. Um, where else am I missing? Uh, Utah. Um, those, uh, those are, and uh, and to a certain degree in in, um, in Mexico as well. How about Hawaii? Uh, I thought I saw something. Well, like- and Hawaii, yeah, the Big Island of Maui. We have. It's funny enough, we have a lot of people for some reason right now that we know moving to Hawaii. Um, yeah, because they've actually there's a couple of reasons for that. One of which is the fact they're actually doing in-person schooling in Hawaii again, so they've re-implemented that. So we're seeing a move in, in that respect. Um, and it's not just there. I mean, it, it, COVID's kind of created an interesting uh, ability for people if they can work remotely to look elsewhere. And a good example of that is uh, some of our offices in Montana. They're getting more interest from buyers from California, predominantly around Los Angeles, uh, and from Manhattan, from New York. Uh, looking to buy and move to Montana. These are people clearly who have not spent a winter in Montana. Right. Interesting. It is very, very interesting. So what, what, when you get up in the morning, Matthew, what's the leading indicator issues you look at? Like you wake up and you're like, let me check on unemployment or how does that work for you? Yeah. Less so. I mean, I think what it used to be was very much that. I mean, I, I've been perennially, I wake up at about 4.30, turn on CNBC, look at pre-market trading. That's just what I've always done. Much to the chagrin of my wife, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but but we've kind of moved. I mean, covid nineteen's now created an interesting kind of dichotomy. Whereas I, we all used to wait, as I did, for, let's say, the monthly unemployment report came out last Friday. Well, a month, that's that's ancient history now. Right. So we've kind of gone more into high frequency data sets. So the kind of things I look at, obviously, one of the most important ones is what's going on with mortgage rates. How do I do that? First thing I'm going to do is check out what the yield is on 10-year treasuries, because that's what drives mortgage rates. Where do you look for that when you get up? Where are you looking? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, Bloomberg News is uh, is kind of that kind of has a, a lot of data for that, and CNBC uh, are two, uh, at least two TV outlets so you can get it. And you can pretty much pick up, uh, just kind of Google in 10-year treasury and you'll get a, a real-time number. So uh, that's one of the things I look at. Obviously, what's going on in the equity markets well, and the stock market, which obviously has been remarkably frenetic uh, over the past several months, because again, that's important from a confidence perspective as well. And there's a lot of kind of other weird things I look at. I look at right now, because of COVID, uh, I get a daily feed on how many people are flying. Because uh, that again will tell me, are we starting to go back out again? There's some great daily data also um, come, uh, coming out of uh, how many people are going out to restaurants to eat. Because these are the kind of things, especially right now, which are going to be the leading indicators for a potential recovery from COVID-19. Although to a degree, I think we've plateaued and we're not going to see much in the way of movement until we get a vaccine or an inoculation that one works and two, that we feel comfortable taking. Right. The second part of your thing, we feel comfortable taking is the big one, right? I'll take it when Dr. Fauci takes it. Me too. That's actually on my list of stuff to talk to you about. Do you look at, uh, I know some of the real estate firms and some of the big, you know, apartment multifamily investors Mm -hmm. like Ken McElroy, as I listen to, he watches um, driver's license stuff as as a migration thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's a migration thing. uh, And it's interesting. It can give you some kind of 
reusable information where people are moving to and from. And it's certainly good for an interstate perspective. So, yeah, I mean, there, there's a ton of weird things out there that, that you can look at. Um, I mean, you can look at home showings now. We can get a, a daily feed on how many home showings are going, going on in America. Uh, then there's some weekly data that comes out from uh, actually realtor.com uh, on what's been going on uh, nationally for them. And obviously mortgage rates, I look at where they're trending weekly and mortgage applications as well. So there's a, a thousand things. If I spent my, I mean, I have some Excel spreadsheets, which are ridiculously big because there's just so much stuff out there, uh, so much rich information, which I need to get so I can distill it down because almost all of it does feed into my forecasts. Awesome. Do you have any like YouTube finance channels that you watch or anything like that? No, unfortunately, I don't have time to do it. Between doing what I do and it's a day job, and I also teach at University of Washington as well, uh, it's finding time. So as much as I would love to, uh, I mean, once in a while, I'll, I'll hit a good podcast if I'm to, out for a, a walk. But it's, just, it's there's only hey, so many hours in the day. Put us on, put us on your list. You got it. I, you know, what are the oddballs out there? We, we're the we're, you're going to like this one. So there you go, guys. Matthew Gardner. Um, well, let's get down to the economics and some stats of what's going on here. We have, um, you know, in particular, I'm talking about maybe King County right now. You're the economist, so I'll let you do the talking. But home prices um, are way up. Um, in fact, banging on the door of an affordability issue. <laughs> um, and how do you think that's going to be playing out? Well, I hardly think banging on the door of it uh, is accurate. Uh, in fact, my biggest fear, and for those uh, of your listeners, and you may as well be aware of it, uh, I've been harping on about housing affordability for decades. Uh, it, it is a major, major concern of mine. It, amongst my other jobs, I also sit on Governor Inslee's Council of Economic Advisors. So I, I visit with the governor very, very frequently. Uh, and I'm always trying to get it across to him that, that unless we can provide more housing that is affordable, at some point, businesses that are thinking about expanding into the Puget Sound, well, there's two things that any company thinks about, one of which is, you know, is there a talented workforce I can hire? Well, yeah, I mean, we are wicked smart over here. We've got that one nailed. But the second equally as important thing is how much you have to pay people. And the biggest component of salaries is what? It's cost of living. So at what point are companies going to say, I've got to pay people how much to live? Well, at that point, they're going to start looking to other markets. They're going to start looking to Spokane, Washington. They're going to start looking to Boise, Idaho. They're going to start looking to Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, why do I choose those three areas? Well, in all three of them, you can buy a single family, brand new construction house for about $350,000. I mean, good luck finding a shoebox around here for that. Right. Uh, and that is a problem. Because if you look at it right now in October, I mean, the average list price for a single family resale home uh, in King County was over $1.34 million. Uh, so affordability is something and it's and King County is quite frankly not affordable for anyone making median income and it's never been affordable for a first time buyer so housing affordability is something which more than anything else keeps me awake at night but the trouble is we've got massive amounts of demand now if anyone that took kind of econ 501 you know what happens if you limit supply but you have net new demand what happens to prices they go up uh, and inventory is down by 34% year over year. So there's very little to buy. There's a lot of demand. That is pushing prices up. And they're able to rise because of where interest rates are. But at some point, we will reach a ceiling. Do you think there's a buyer sentiment uh, involved in, I, I feel like the middle of 2018, when we kind of had a hard stop and a little drop, yeah. that you know, was due to buyers essentially taking a pause, not because they couldn't buy, but because they were frustrated with participating in the escalations and the multiple offer situations. And they said, you know what, I'm just going to take a little back seat for a minute and just let things pass by. But the problem with that is then we took a, a drop of, you're the economist, I don't know what it was, 10% or 12%. Um, but then here we are back in the same situation again, except this time maybe worse because inventory is even worse with low rates so low that are going to fuel the low inventory. Well, and, and yes, what you're saying is accurate and there were there was concerns, but you need that there's another layer onto that as well. Because in 2018, uh, we were knocking on the door of 5% for a fixed rate mortgage. Which and, everybody thought was good at the time. Well, actually, no, because in September, sorry, in, in uh, 2017, we were down in the high threes. 
So we actually saw 100 bips, a, a full one percentage point increase. So if you look at where mortgage rates were in October of 2017, they're about 3.9%. October of 2018, they were 4.8%. So it, it is that one percentage point increase uh, over and above the, the things that you mentioned, which are accurate as well, which certainly gave the market a, a fairly significant pause. Now, obviously, we've seen rates contract dramatically from that point, uh, but that was happening then. Uh, and right now, in as much as we've been able to see prices rise at the rate we've been seeing it, purely based upon the fact that mortgages are, they seem to be breaking historic records on a weekly basis today. I mean, if you're at 2.8 on a 30-year fixed, the interest rate on a 30-year fixed mortgage today is lower than on a 5.1 arm. Uh, so the relative advantage of taking out an arm doesn't exist anymore. Right. But that can only go so far because mortgage rates can't come down much further. So at some, but, so at some point, we always must have one thing. We must have a relationship between home prices and incomes. We've broken it. So at some point, we have to actually see that return. How does that return? Uh, slowing down price growth, uh, bottom line. Although what is also the, the spanner in the works today uh, is this ability for some people to work from home. And we are already seeing it here in King County. People that are told, I mean, I, I've got to give you another good example, my eldest son. Both he and his new wife both work for Amazon. They had a ridiculously expensive apartment in South Lake Union. And they were told by Amazon, no, don't ever come back to work again. So what did they do? They left that $4,000 a month apartment, went down to Oregon uh, and bought a house outside of Portland. And their mortgage is probably a bit more than half of what their rent was. So what we could see for those people that are allowed to work from home, we are going to see them not saying that everyone's going to move to Portland, believe me. But what we have seen already is people move out of King County, go up into Snohomish County, into markets like Mount Lake Terrace, markets like Everett, which we're, where we're seeing some massive gentrification and putting down either paying all cash or 50 percent deposits. Uh, and so I think that that is likely in concert with the things I've mentioned of mortgage rates ultimately rising and affordability being an issue. Some, not everyone, uh, it is going to end up going north or going south to where it is considerably cheaper because they don't have to be next to their offices anymore. Right. Do you think that there will be, you know, how do you control the, our, our, our home prices then controlled a little bit by the interest rates going up, right? Oh, massively. Yeah. Right. So, for, so for every one percentage point increase in mortgage rates, you can afford to buy 10% less house. Right. And so will there be any type of... Um, a purposeful push on that, um, but that, how does that then collides with the low inventory still? I mean, it's just a, I don't know, it's like a pickle. Yeah, and it is. And so there, there, there's a lot to unwrap in what you're saying, but it, several things, one of which is, are mortgage rates going to rise significantly anytime soon? Absolutely not. Uh, that just no one's seeing that happening. I'm certainly not seeing it happening. So that's point one. So they're not going to drop down further, but nor are they going to rise significantly. Yet at the same time, we are living in our homes today for twice as long as we did a decade ago. We're not moving as frequently, and we're also not downsizing. So those people that are looking to retire, they're staying in their homes longer, predominantly because they're not retiring when they uh, had anticipated they would. They're living longer, need more money, health insurance and the like. So if they're not downsizing, then the move-up buyers have got nothing to buy. If they've got nothing to buy, then the first-time buyers, well, they're shot. So there's that. But the only one way we can really sort this out in terms of uh, of slowing down price growth is to build more. Right. And that is sadly what we are not doing. Right. Uh, right. Why not? Why not? Oh, you have to look at new construction and sit on the single family side uh, and look at it kind of like uh, like a square. There's four components to it. One, land. Think about land prices. A single family lot, for example, up in Bothell, you can buy it for I know about 350,000. That means the house you, that a builder would have to put on it's got to be valued at 1.3 million to make a margin. I like bottle. I don't like million three bottle. So that's the problem. We're not, we're not creating any, any more land, no doubt about that. Also, we have remarkably restrictive uh, growth management boundaries. Those aren't going to change. And our zoning, I would argue, is antiquated. Right. So without land, push up land prices. Secondly, labor. No one's learning to become a plumber, carpenter, an electrician. Uh, 
That's pushing up labor costs significantly. A lot of builders, a lot of laborers, they got out of the uh, the market back in 2008. They all went to the Dakotas. They went fracking. So they got into the oil industry. They've not come back. That pushes up those costs. Then you look at material costs. Softwood lumber prices are up by 173% since April. And so that's become, and it's not just lumber. And lumber, it's not only for the fact we've got forest fires, it's hitting warehouses, land, and various other things, but also we're taxing lumber coming down from Canada now, the Canadian softwood lumber tariff. So prices for that are going up, prices for copper, for steel going up because of trade wars with China. So all those material costs are going up as well. And finally, regulatory fees. 25 cents of every dollar it costs to build a home in America are regulatory fees. So if you imagine that you are Bob the Builder and uh, uh, you're thinking about building a development and you, you you pencil it out and say, okay, great, I can uh, I can build this. I've got to sell all the homes for an average of $900,000 to make a margin. That's fine. But if the market price acceptance point is 600000 are you going to build it? No, you won't. And that's the biggest issue we have. So ultimately, is there a way around it? Yeah, I think we have to loosen up zoning significantly. But the trouble with that, you get a lot of pushback by the existing neighbors in, in that area. They don't right. want to change. Hey, guys, it's Julie here with a quick break from the show to discuss an opportunity some of you may have interest in, which is to work more closely with me. On almost a daily basis, I get calls from investors and brokers, both new and experienced, asking me for guidance or advice. I love helping you guys out, and it keeps me on my toes too. So with that said, I wanted to let you know that I have a private broker coaching community called the VIP Education Community, and the best part is that it's 100% free. That's right, it's free to join. So whether you're a traditional broker or a broker investor, my VIP education community offers personalized one-on-one coaching from not just me, but also from my experienced broker friends with expertise in all disciplines of real estate and real estate investing. We'll teach and share our modern marketing strategies, our tech and lead generation resources, plus teach you how to identify or offer up opportunities for yourself or for your clients using techniques such as seller financing, lease options, land entitlement deals, burr investing, flipping, multifamily or commercial coaching, whatever you like, we've got it all covered for you. The future of real estate is changing fast and to stay in the game, it's time to learn about all the options you can offer your buyer and seller clients, as well as if you want, learn how to use those skills to grow your own real estate portfolio. If you'd like more details about joining my VIP education community, reach out to me at julie at seattleinvestorsclub.com or text me at 206 910 2985, or just send me a Facebook message. My new favorite phrase is community equals confidence. So let's navigate the future of real estate together. Now back to the show. What do you and, feel about the ADUs and the DADUs? Well, do you they work. That at now, all? Do you track any of that? They're very expensive. One, they're very expensive to build. Uh, secondly, most of them are done to rent out uh, rather than doing fee simple. So uh, I think it can have some assistance to the rental market rather than the ownership market. But we just need to embrace density. And I'll give you a good example on this. 70% of the city of Seattle is zoned single family. Now, that probably made sense back when zoning was created in 1938. It's not right now. So what we have seen in other parts of the country, it started out in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, is the fact that within any single family zoned area in the city, you are allowed to build not a single family home, but duplexes, triplexes, or four packs. And that is a way to increase density in the city. The state of Oregon has just adopted an almost identical policy. It doesn't come into play until next uh, next May outside uh, of our metropolitan statistical areas and a year after inside them. But they're looking to do that as well. So we need to look at, at zoning in a far more thoughtful way. We, we can't make any more land. We've got too many mountains, too much water. Uh, and so, but we need to figure out how we can do it. Because uh, if we don't add on to housing stock, we've got massively, well, huge demographic demand. Uh, and But we are creating forced renters because they just can't afford to buy. Right, right. I'm going to circle back to what you said um, and sort of tie in something else here. You said about your son 
Uh, and uh, them living in South Lake Union in an extremely expensive apartment. And now everybody's uh, not told they don't have to come back to work. And you've got all these big landlords down there. Um, do you feel what, how is the, the, we have two layers or I'm sure lots more of commercial real estate owners um, that are being impacted by the work from home uh, phenomenon that, you know, we can talk about whether that's staying or going or whatever. Um, but there's a lot of, I'm sure plenty of construction projects, development projects. I know of some myself that are stalled, whether they're office or residential, maybe because of COVID and, um, you know, landlords, even big ones being impacted by, their buildings emptying out. Do you think there's a trickle down effect to the two layers of a question here? Is there a trickle down effect to single family housing somehow there as a connection because, or how does that impact single family at all? And second, do you think now that Biden may or may not have won, um, uh, will, will welcome foreign national buyers back to the scene here in our area to maybe scoop up some of these stalled development projects or issues with some of the multifamily or commercial projects because they have a different reason for buying U.S. real estate? Wow. Uh, a very expansive question. Um, so on the apartment world, uh, already, obviously, we've seen significant rental rate re reductions. Uh, I've seen a couple of projects now offering three months free rent on a 12-month lease. Uh, now, we've started to see some concessions come into play last year, and that's predominantly because we, we've seen a massive glut oversupply of apartments. So that's in place. I believe that the larger apartment owners, they'll hang in there. They'll, they'll be just fine. They financed at remarkably favorable rates. However, the value of the asset certainly is dropping. So when it comes to it, uh, they look to refi. That, that might be a different issue, but we're going down a, a strange road, and I don't want to go there. But we're seeing some cap rate decompression, which obviously drops values. So... Uh, the biggest concern right now is the moratoria on evictions. Uh, you cannot get rid of a, a tenant. And in fact, in the city of Seattle, the moratoria extends beyond the end of the year because uh, the city um, council uh, made the decision a year ago to add another layer onto that, which is a, a winter non-eviction. So even for the first three months of, of next year, you still can't throw people out. So certainly there's no doubt a lot of landlords are suffering. I think the smaller landlords are the ones who are going to hurt more. They've still got that debt to pay. The larger institutional investors are, I'm less concerned about. A lot of people have been asking me about, do I expect to see a massive wave of conversions from apartments yeah. to condominiums? Well, I mean, perhaps we'll talk about condos a bit later on, but right now my question would be very simple. Is, is, is there going to be enough demand if we are seeing that migration away from our urban centers because a lot of these younger tech workers don't have to be downtown, they can be somewhere else. Is there going to be enough demand? On the office side, yeah, I mean, obviously we've got a, a lot of space right now. And again, people are asking me about uh, a, are a lot of companies going to downsize. And I would offer a slightly different perspective. Uh, and it's this. Back in the day, uh, back in the 1990s, basically every uh, every worker occupied about 250 gross square feet. That's gross, including common areas. Now, that's shrunk down over the last 20 or 25 years to about 140. And by the way, if you work at Amazon, it's down to 90. So they, they're shoehorning more and more people in there. Now, if there's going to be fewer people in an office at any one time, that by the rights should mean that they require less space. But what if they require as an individual more space because of social distancing? So fewer people, but more space. So I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it'll be worthwhile keeping an eye on as we go forward. Uh, do, I ex do I expect to see a lot, of, a lot of fallout? I mean, my biggest fear, and I'll be honest with you, it's not office, it's not apartment, it's hotels. We've got about half a trillion dollars uh, of CMBS paper out there. And hotels are going to be suffering for a long time. But then, then, then you come in, and that's where the foreign national buyer question comes in. Uh, maybe they have different reasons for buying those types of projects than U.S. Uh, owners do because of their tax laws and the depreciation, and you know, just protecting their their assets, getting them out of whatever country that they're in. 
Yeah. And then it comes down to obviously down to the asset value. If you look at, let's say, the uh, commercial office market in, in the third quarter uh, in the metro area, we, we broke above 10 percent vacancy. So the problem with that is going to come down to a discrepancy between what an owner believes uh, that their building is worth and what a buyer is prepared to pay for it. So I, I think there's a lot of moving parts there right now. Not, I mean, do I believe that real estate, both commercial and residential, is a solid investment? Yeah, in most sectors it is. I'm still excited about industrial, believe it or not. Warehouse distribution space has done remarkably well. Uh, I, I fear, as I mentioned earlier, for hotel, I fear for ma- Main Street retail a lot. That That's very, very troubling. Less so for apartments, but the big question, and it's a massive one, it is the fact that, okay, if you go ahead and buy, are there going to be enough people to occupy that space if we are moving out? Now, what we are already seeing, for example, in Manhattan, people moving into Manhattan to rent who were previously priced out of it. But because rents have dropped so significantly, they can now afford to live in Midtown, which they were never able to do. They had to go across uh, to Jersey. So uh, I I think there's a a lot of interesting things we're going to start seeing, which we've never seen before, probably, but that won't kick in until sometime next year. Yeah, man, it's all interesting, isn't it? So uh, vaccine news, some good news came out, um, you know, right, supposedly. But then and then the big fear is, well, will everybody take it? Right. Right. I, 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 I think the impact on the economy, what we saw is that was remarkable. I mean, in essence, back in March, late March, early April, we turned the economic lights off. I mean, literally, uh, it, we lost. <laughs> it's an interesting number to talk about jobs that were lost. I took numbers going back from October 2010 to February 2020. We added about a bit more than 20 million jobs in that uh, almost 10 year time frame. We lost more jobs than that in two months. So this is something which we've never seen before. Now, we are starting to see a very slow job recovery. Job numbers that came out for October, 638,000, I think it was. Mediocre at best. We're still down by 10 million. But I think so many people, uh, so many businesses, they are waiting for a vaccine, which, as you said, one, we can get, two, that we we feel comfortable taking. Because we as, as individuals have a we have a contract with other people that uh, I'm okay sitting here talking to you if I believe you're not going to infect me. So I think a lot of the recovery, it's going to take some time before we get that, before that social contract actually comes back into play again. Uh, and that is what's going to hold back our overall economic recovery, uh, really, until we get to that that point in time. And also remember this, that, I mean, two jobs in, in 10 in America are in two specific industry sectors. One's leisure and hospitality, bars, restaurants, hotels. The second, retail. That's 20% of our workforce. And they are the ones that are being massively impacted and will stay that way until we actually get a vaccine out. Hopefully sometime next spring, but we know we've got uh, a group out of uh, my alma mater, out of Oxford. Uh, They announced that they've got some great things coming out right now. Also, University of Washington, go dogs. Uh, they've got a, another a vaccine in the plan as well. And the, there's a total, I believe, of eight in human trials. So I'm hopeful, but a lot of people, understandably, are going to say, you know, a vaccine normally takes five to 10 years, not five to 10 months. So the big question is going to be, will we take it? And quite frankly, what's the distribution uh, going to look like? Right. And and what about in the interim before you know, the, that starts coming out. We're having this huge wave of increase in, uh, in people getting infected right now. What, what, what is it possible? Um, I heard you listen. I was on the YPN listening to you the other day. Thank you very much for that. And, you know, you did mention that Inslee would go ahead and shut us down if need be. Mm. What, you know, we, like I said, we have investors and agents and people that listen to us all across the country here what is what is happening right now as far as infections rising and the timing of all this vaccine stuff that's not going to match up with the fact that today uh, we have rising and are we going to have economies shut down again and go back down a rabbit hole? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, firstly, on a national basis, yeah. I mean, we, we broke above 100,000 new infections back on the 4th of this month. Now over 100,000 per day is the norm. It's scary. It, it really is. And that's, uh, there's a lot of reasons for it. One, school's going back. Secondly, winter kick- kicking in. Now we're inside more than we are outside. So th- that is certainly happening. And 
most of it, however, it's not actually in Washington state. We are doing, we could do better, there's no question. But overall infection rates actually have been falling statewide. There are select pockets uh, who are not performing as well. Our friends down in Auburn aren't doing as well as us here in Seattle. But nationally, uh, I mean, California has uh, gone backwards, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, Illinois, Texas, certainly, are areas we've seen some massive spikes. But again, it's not across the country. But you mentioned about, about Governor Inslee. Yeah. I mean, so the last several months, um, we've been on uh, on calls with the governors of Oregon, so Governor Brown uh, and California, Governor Newsom, uh, on deciding how we can reopen uh, the West Coast, basically. And Governor Inslee is very, very focused on the numbers. Uh, and he believes it. He, even when he was running for, for governor again, you know, if this thing goes backwards, I will not shut things down completely, but we'll start pulling back again. So all I would say to everyone listening, wherever you are in the country, you know what? It, it's very important. Wear that mask. And if you're real estate brokers, I know you love to hug. Please stop. <laughs> uh, and if you do that, that will make this economist very happy. So I, I don't see a shutting down again, but we are go- in the process of entering a what could be potentially a very scary period through the winter, especially if we have a bad flu season as well. So let's say we get this all squared away with a vaccine on this particular virus and so forth. Um, Are you adding a line to your spreadsheet of what you track in the future going forward on tracking epidemiology and viruses and this kind of crap? I mean, what, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, yeah, yeah, it's, I, I think that obviously it's been a long time. 1918 uh, Spanish flu p- pandemic was the last real one that we had. I think that we will see more over time. Now, that actually, there's an interesting thought that I, I've been working on recently. And that is this. Now, when it, March, early April, certainly we saw the world shut down, certainly the United States did. Did it impact housing? Of course, because you couldn't transact. No one was sure what was going on. But the snapback that we saw in housing demand was remarkably quick. Yeah. Literally, after a slowdown of literally a few weeks, all of a sudden it's back. Now, what was going on? But I think a lot of people back then were looking at their maybe their stock portfolios, which for a period of time were down by 34 35%, and looking at housing and saying, well, what happened to housing prices? They didn't go anywhere. So there is the potential for people to look at ownership housing as a way to hedge against any future pandemic. Interesting. So we're seeing, uh, so I think that demand is going to be very solid. At the same time, I think we're going to find more people moving because of the fact that, I'm not sure about you guys, but I've been working for my dining room table now for almost nine months. Uh, it's fine for me, but a lot of people out there are saying, you know, this space I'm in doesn't work if I'm going to be working from home three, four days a week. So I think we could see people moving uh, in that respect as well. And I also think there's one other more unique scenario. Uh, what do we do when we look at anything too long? We get bored. And I think right. there's a lot of people. I've spent more time in my Including home. Including our life. spouses, Matthew. Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> watch divorce rates over the next several. Anyway, um, so I think what we're going to find is people are going to say, you know, I really don't like my living room, my kitchen. Yeah. So we could see more people move because of that. So, I mean, ultimately, uh, housing without a doubt, and certainly the ownership housing market in general, has been a a shining light through this uh, this very, very unique period of contraction. And it's not going to stop. Demographically driven growth, think millennials. And for all of you brokers out there, if you're not working with them, start. Uh, because they are a massive component of our economy. They're the largest generational cohort in the workforce today. They're buying a lot of homes in the three-county area, uh, the greater Seattle metro area. Uh, over almost half of homes that sold with conventional financing were sold to millennials, and that's from January 1 until the end of September. So if you're not working with them, do it, because they are not just big now, but they haven't peaked yet. Uh, the peak millennial, uh, millennials turn 30, the The most is actually going to be, I think, next year. So we've got a a flood of them. They're getting older. They are getting into real relationships. They're having kids. And because of that, what are they going to do? Buying a home for 69% of them, they believe it will be the most astute financial uh, thing that they ever do, investment they ever make. So if you're a broker out there, work with them. They might be, they can be interesting. Um, They love to tweet. Uh, but and you'll become their best friend. And by the way, if you tweet with them, don't put a period at the end of your tweet. They think you're shouting at them. Uh, 
But uh, but so I think in all long winded answer to a direct question is that irrespective of the broader economy, and think about it this way: the economy was in very good shape in February. So this was artificial more than anything else. Housing has been done remarkably well, uh, and a lot of uh, housing reporters I speak to, and of course reporters, they like the bad side. So if I'm on CNBC or whatever with, with Diane with Olick, uh, she always wants to see the negative side, and I'm just not seeing it. But if there is a problem, I will hit on it again. It is affordability. Right. Absolutely. Good stuff. Well, we're going to, I got a just last couple questions for you here, but I know you're got so many of these probably more to do today and we appreciate your time so much. Um, this isn't a political channel by any means, but do you think that um, assuming that we have a president, um, which we do at the moment, I guess, again, I don't know, not political channel, will cabinet picks make a difference in the economy? Cabinet picks. Um, well, that, that's an interesting theory. Uh, it's, I, I would say, like again, stock the market. Oh, stock market. oh, yeah. All right. So the bottom line on, on the stock market is this stock markets like uh, a, a blend. And when I say that the S&P 500 has outperformed its at long term average when a Democrat is in the White House and Republicans control Senate. That's just a point of fact. GDP outperforms. So uh, our economy outperforms when there is a Democrat uh, in the White House and a Senate uh, controlled by Republicans. So uh, it, right now, we obviously have clearly seen the last several days that the stock market has done very well, one, with the presumption that we've got a new administration, and it is still a presumption, but secondly, because of, of these wonderful vaccine ideas. So stock's doing great, although the S&P is down right now. Uh, it's uh, it, it, the, the trend for the last week or so has been very positive. So I think that that is going to be something which Right now, uh, its impact on housing is the question which I'm being asked about 500 times a day, is what's housing going to look like under a, a Biden administration? And quite frankly, it's too early to say. And it's too yeah. early because it's going to depend on both of the Senate runoffs in Georgia, which we won't know about until January. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, we'll check back with you. Maybe by the grace of God, we'll be able to get you back on here someday again, because this has been so much fun. So last um, last couple questions. Um, okay. What about the fact that the, the, they might be printing more and that the, is there a devaluation of the dollar with all this money printing or any money? What's your money take on the dollar and stimulus and impacting anything in our economy that trickles down to us agents, brokers and investors? I remember clearly giving speeches in uh, in 2008 and 2009. What's interesting about those times was that my speeches changed from being breakfast speeches to dinner speeches. Why? <laughs> booze. Um, <laughs> it's a lot easier hearing economists say, guess what, guys, next year is going to suck worse than this year uh, when you've had a couple of snifters. But the biggest, I remember, I'll never forget uh, having a very robust discussion with, with a, a gentleman back then who was basically saying, you know what, I'm buying gold. We're going to see hyperinflation, qualitative easing. We're printing money. I'm like, okay, if you want to go and kind of buy canned goods, a gun and move to Montana, go for it. Uh, I, I don't see it happening. And I was right. We went through qualitative easing one, two, three, and four, and we did not see any form of significant inflationary pressures. We expanded the M1, the money supply uh, was expanded. Again, we didn't see inflation. Now, Chair Powell, head of the Federal Reserve, he's made some changes recently, although he said, understandably, that he's going to keep monetary policy very adoptive, which which is, is smart um, because of the fact that the economy has to keep open. Therefore, he's going to keep uh, interest rates and certainly Fed funds rate at essentially zero. I don't see us going negative, though. But what he also said was that the goal of stable inflation, it was always based around a permanent 2% inflation. He's now willing to let that get above it. He's looking at a longer term average, which is very unusual. And a lot of economists, including myself, are trying to figure out what that really means. But again, the bottom That's line is with wages, right? If wages don't. Is there yeah. A uh, and we haven't seen wage inflation. Um, and you, you tend not to see wage inflation in a, an economy that's still got kind of above average uh, unemployment. So we will see some wage growth next year. But uh, in terms of real wage growth, real uh, being adjusted for inflation, it's next to nothing. So you can't really see it in that respect. But most importantly, with the expansion of the money supply, which we were printing money again, there is a massive and always has been a massive demand for dollars outside of America. 
The American dollar is the de facto currency in 38 countries across the planet, or around okay. the planet. So uh, I see that demands there. I'm not seeing any form of hyperinflation. Uh, and I'm certainly expecting you will get up to that 2% threshold uh, sometime next year. But getting into that kind of 3, 4, 5, or the hyperinflation of the 70s, just not seeing it. And I'm not aware of any economist out there that's forecasting significant inflation uh, occurring anytime, at least within a forecast period that we all look at. Uh- all good stuff. I'm going to throw you off with my last question. And you might not even you might not even like this question. I don't know. What do you think about digital currency and Bitcoin and its impact on the future, if any? I trust it as far as I can throw it. OK. Um, uh, and, and here's why. I mean, I think it's interesting. I think governments will, without a doubt, want to get a piece of the action uh, in that respect. There's no question about it. Thanks. But you know, But you know what I mean? It's I thought it was interesting when America, uh, under the Nixon administration, came off the gold standard. Uh, and that was a silly thing, in my opinion, but that's just because that's I'm English. But uh, but they did that. Um, now, you see, I don't trust anything that's not backed by anything, point one. Point two, the energy consumption necessary to create a coin is humongous. Uh, it is, again, a, a big issue. But the biggest one, ultimately, is always is government. Government will want to get their hands in one way, shape, or another. Now, you see the massive swings in volatility in Bitcoin. And if you time it right, you can do remarkably well. But you know anything that's backed by nothing, by, by the ether, I just don't trust. I want to touch it, feel it, smell it, and see it uh, before I trust it. So uh, it's out there. It's not going away, I don't believe. But I think that it's still at the very early days. Uh, ultimately, I think it will get adopted, but only likely when you get some kind of regulatory controls. All right. Good stuff. Well, speaking of trust, Matthew, we certainly trust the information that you've provided us with all these years. Um, And it's been an absolute honor and pleasure to have you on our podcast today. And I hope maybe we can do it again at some point when all the uh, bounces of our lives and our economies uh, continue to to, uh, move down the path here. Um, Last thing, what do you like to do for fun? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm an ocean kayaker, so uh, I take off for a couple of weeks every summer. And I normally go up to Canada, although I've been banned this year. Uh, so <laughs> I, I like basically kind of leaving my phone behind. Me and a friend of mine, we've done it every every year for the last decade. Uh, we we take off and just go and, and and paddle and not basically not see anyone for a, for a couple of weeks. Just get completely off the grid. That's what I I, I live. Uh, I get up every day not knowing the fact that the middle of August will come around and I can disappear off and hide for a few weeks. <laughs> well, thanks for letting us get to know you today. I um, hope everybody has enjoyed this. It's been, I love, I'm a nerd, so I geek out on this stuff. It's been absolutely wonderful. I could go on like this forever, but we know how busy you are and how valuable your time is. So I'm going to wrap it up, guys. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, If you like uh, the information that we're able to share through all the fantastic guests that we have here on the Nuts and Bolts of Real Estate Investing Podcast, um, Joe, where can they find the details? And also don't forget, guys, to join our YouTube channel where all our hundreds of podcast videos, tips of the day, and everything else is located in an easy, user-friendly format for you. Um, and of course, join us every Thursday. And Matthew, if you ever get a bug in your ear and you're, you've, you've had a good coffee on a Thursday morning and you're not busy as heck, give us a surprise and join us on our weekly roundtable mastermind, which happens every single Thursday from 1130 to 1230 p.m. Um, on Zoom. You can grab that access to, to join us on that meeting, everybody, um, just off our meetup.com page for Seattle Investors Club. Grab it on a Thursday morning. Join us from 1130 to 1230, where we talk all things real estate. We have all our agents and lenders and brokers, and we have 1031 exchange people, property managers. Um, We have pretty much everything goes in an open discussion, whatever the hot topics of the week are, and whatever anybody needs problem with a collective group solving your problems and encouraging you and, and, you know, um, it's really a fantastic format and um, it's been life changing for me so hope you all join us again so today Joe where can everybody find the details of today's podcast with the one and only Matthew Gardner. 
Yeah, you can get to all the show notes at seattleinvestorsclub.com slash 131. That's seattleinvestorsclub.com slash 131. If you guys like this show, please give us a review on your favorite listening station area app. And and Mike and Matthew, if people are not uh, Windermere brokers, because you are Windermere's economist, though, um, where can people follow along with your reports? Or is that only, is well, that? No, it's not. Uh, yeah, you can uh, certainly follow me on Facebook. Um uh, which will be under Windermere Economics, also uh, on LinkedIn, which I think is MJD Gardner, or Twitter at Seattle Econ. Perfect. All right, guys, get your head out of the stand and follow everything Mike uh, Matthew says, and we will uh, catch you next time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to the Seattle Investors Club podcast. If you have questions that you'd like to have answered on the show, shoot us an email at info at seattleinvestorsclub.com. Now go out, take that action, and build that real estate business. Thanks for listening.